Philippians chapter 1. <clears throat> As you turn there, let me just say I appreciate the invitation, the, uh, the kind hospitality of the church and uh, uh, putting us up and uh, having us here. We know a conference requires a lot of work. We say all the men who have come to preach, we pray that it's a blessing to your assembly. Um, I would say that uh, Brother Doug, there's no way that he could have known when he invited me to preach and gave me this passage, that this was the passage of scripture that the Lord used to bring me to faith many years ago. So I am glad to have the opportunity to preach it. First Corinthians chapter 1, and we're just going to read verses 21 through 24, but we'll look at much of the context of the chapter. Starting at verse 21. It says, for after that, in the wisdom of God, the world by wisdom knew not God. It pleased God by the foolishness of preaching to save them that believe. For the Jews require a sign, and the Greeks seek after wisdom. But we preach Christ crucified, unto the Jews a stumbling block, and unto the Greeks foolishness. But unto them which are called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power of God, and the wisdom of God. The topic I've been given today is Jesus Christ, the wisdom of God. I'm at the college when I teach the uh, wisdom literature in the Old Testament. I always try to begin by uh, explaining the difference between knowledge and wisdom. They should always go together, but there is a difference between wisdom and knowledge. Knowledge is just gaining information. Wisdom is the right way to apply the information that you gain. So, for example, when you gain knowledge, uh, scientifically you'll learn that both tomatoes and green beans are classified as fruit because they have seeds within them. That's knowledge. Wisdom tells you green beans and tomatoes do not belong in fruit salad. Okay, it doesn't matter if they're a fruit. In this world, God has gifted mankind with this tremendous amount of knowledge. We've gained so much information about God's creation and the way it works, the, the laws of God that he's designed in nature, the interaction between chemicals and processes of uh, math and science and language. And yet for all of that knowledge, we have yet to approach in true wisdom. You'll find in this passage that worldly wisdom is an illusion. It is in the eyes of our Creator nothing more than foolishness. And so it's in this way that Paul presents to us Jesus Christ as the power and the wisdom of God. It's my intention to present Jesus as the wisdom of God from this passage and point out three different ways. First, his wisdom is beyond the power of this world. Secondly, his wisdom is beyond the wisdom of this world. And then finally, his wisdom is beyond all the men of this world. So first off, let's look at the, the wisdom of Jesus is beyond the power of this world. Look up at verse 19 for just a moment. Paul says, for it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise and bring to nothing the understanding of the prudent. Where is the wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the disputer of this world? Hath not God made the foolish, made foolish the wisdom of this world? Paul there is quoting from Isaiah 29, verse 14. Uh, and he's referring to the Old Testament account about a fellow named Sennacherib. Now, I know that's a, a funny sounding name, but uh, I would tell you there was a day when the name Sennacherib would make the whole of the known world tremble. He's the Assyrian leader who led an uh, army into Judah, intent on its destruction. And God had promised through the prophet Isaiah that Sennacherib would fail. Now, knowing the might and the reputation of that man's army, worldly wisdom and worldly power would have told you there was no chance Judah could prevail. Other countries went out of their way to make peace with Sennacherib. They would give him anything he asked for because if they didn't, he would just take it anyway. In fact, there was a whole class of officers in Sennacherib's army who he called scribes, whose job it was to record all the stuff that he had taken in tribute, whether it was 
5,000 pieces of silver, 500 heads of cattle, 500 heads of the royal family. Whatever he wanted, he got. He took it. Sennacherib had even sent a letter to King Hezekiah. You can read about this back in 2 Kings 18 and 19. And the letter essentially said, don't let God fool you. I've defeated all the other kingdoms and their gods, and I'll defeat yours too. And Hezekiah brings that letter to the temple. He lays it out before the Lord. Scott, do you see this? Look at this. And he's not lying. He's really done these things. And he'll do it to us too if you don't stop. Sennacherib sends men to the walls of the city who know how to speak Hebrew so that they start shouting the message into the walls to the residents of the city saying, don't let King Hezekiah fool you. Don't let him convince you to trust in God. You come out here, you make an agreement with me, and you can enjoy the rest of your life. Worldly wisdom has no hope against that kind of power. But God said Sennacherib would be defeated. And this is the important part. It was not going to be by human wisdom or by human might. That's what Paul is quoting there. You're not going to be saved by diplomacy. You're not going to be saved by military might. You're not going to be saved by cunning leadership. And you're not going to see God defeated by the power of this world. Now, if you know that story, you know what happens. Isaiah 37, verse 6 says, The angel of the Lord went forth and smote in the camp of the Assyrians a hundred and fourscore and five thousand. And when they arose early in the morning, behold, they were all dead corpses. 185,000 dead, just like that. And the people of Judah could shout, What happened to the mighty Sennacherib? Where are all the wise men who planned how to destroy God's city? Where are the scribes who are going to write the details of all the things that they took and say what great power Sennacherib has? What's happened to this world's power? Now that's the fulfillment in Isaiah's day, and Paul's quoting that here to the Corinthians because it again points to the power and wisdom of Jesus. Paul shows it in verse 20. Where is the wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the disputer of this world? Is not God made foolish the wisdom of this world? Where's the disputer of this world? Literally, that is this age. What Paul's asking is essentially, where's today's Sennacherib? Well, you know what? They're everywhere. Human nature hasn't changed. God's wisdom has not changed. The parallel between these stories is that the power of this world, even today, stands and shouts the same way Sennacherib did. You have no hope. Look what you've done. Look what you are. The best thing for you to do is to come out here, make an agreement with the world, live in your sinful, fleshly lusts, and enjoy the rest of your life. It's the only way you'll have peace. Don't trust God for it. He can't help you. And if you believe the power of this world is supreme, then you will believe that message. But God, in the message of wisdom through his son Jesus Christ, promises deliverance from the power of this world. Man. And you're not going to be saved by diplomacy, and you're not going to be saved by your own strength and power. You've got no basis for hope in worldly cleverness. You're absolutely helpless. And that is the way that God achieves glory through his son Jesus Christ, who is the power and the wisdom of God. Paul's using this Sennacherib of example because the cross of Christ accomplishes the same kind of crushing defeat. God displays the ultimate futility of the world's power and might. The cross of Jesus Christ, the message of the gospel is the power of God and it is the means through which true wisdom is obtained. Because Jesus is beyond the power of this world. He is also beyond the wisdom of this world. Look at verse 21. 
Paul says, for after that, in the wisdom of God, the world by wisdom knew not God. It pleased God by the foolishness of preaching to save them that believe. The world by wisdom knew not God. Paul's again making a comparison here. Though. There's the wisdom of God which we need and the wisdom of this world which we have. And that worldly wisdom has never yet, not one single time in all of human history, has it ever brought somebody to the knowledge of God. Wise scientists can argue that life is evolved, but they cannot bring you to God who is the author of life. Amen. Why psychologists will tell you, well, you have low self-esteem, you need to think better of yourself. And so they cannot bring you to the God who says, you humble yourself, Amen. and he'll exalt you in your time. Amen. Wise mathematicians can use an equation to figure, you know, the, the area of this room or calculate a lapse time, but they can't bring you to God who exists outside of space and time. Amen. Wise physicians can cut you open, rearrange your insides, stitch you back up, but they can't bring you to the great physician who alone determines whether or not you survive that. Yes. The goal of true wisdom is to bring a person to the knowledge of God. All you have to do is read the wisdom books in the Old Testament to understand that truth, that the, the message there, the fear of God is the beginning of wisdom and knowledge. The conclusion of the whole matter is the fear of God and keep his commandments. <laughs> Worldly wisdom will not take you there. Now it's interesting how Paul pictures it. Let me ask you, if you look at the beginning of verse 21, ask yourself this question. Where does the wisdom of the world exist? All the people, all the vain philosophers, all the educated men exist within the wisdom of God. Amen. It's often God's will and plan to allow mankind to our own devices, to our own wisdom, even though that entire time we are surrounded by the wisdom and power of God. The invisible things from the creation of the world proclaim his existence. Scientists investigate creation and they can't see a creator. Science wisdom will not bring you to God. Religious wisdom. You don't think about how silly our best religious wisdom is when it comes to humanity. Amen. Think about the Old Testament idol worshippers. They'd go down, they'd cut down a tree, they'd use a third of it to build their house, a third of it to build a fire to make their soup, and with the other third of it, they'd carve a little idol to set on the mantle and say, that's God. I made him, and I'll tell him what to do. That's the best we can do on our own. I wonder if when Paul wrote this, he was thinking about the city of Athens, the world of philosophy and wisdom in Greek culture was centered in Athens, particularly a place called Mars Hill where they worshipped mythical gods. And when Paul went to Mars Hill, he saw one altar after another, but one in particular caught his attention. It was just labeled, to the unknown god. Oh yeah, we've got our goddess of fertility and our god of the sea and our goddess of forgiveness, but let's just make up another altar in case we've missed somebody. In reality, that altar was nothing more than a confession of their own ignorance. Amen. Because the world in the wisdom of God, the world in its wisdom, knew not God. They didn't know him. But here's the precious part. It pleased God by the foolishness of preaching to save them in the evening. Mm -hmm. right. Now I think we can just admit right here, sometimes preaching can get pretty foolish. Mm -hmm. I don't need y'all to admit <laughs> But that's not exactly what Paul's saying here. The foolishness of preaching is not the same as the preaching of foolishness. Amen. He's not focused on the delivery of the message as much as he is the message itself. Right. It is the simplicity of the gospel that confounds the wisest of men. That's what he means by the foolishness of preaching. The proclamation of God's simple message. It is an elementary message. Look, it makes sense that God made things simple. He was dealing with a bunch of simpletons. Morons, really, is the Greek word here for foolishness, is where we get our word moronic from. Have you ever tried to teach a foolish person something? 
any complicated task becomes just so befuddling <laughs> to them, you eventually say, okay, that's it. I give up. Might as well just do it myself. Well, what's God done? He's looked down at a bunch of lost, depraved, incapable, foolish simpletons and said, okay, I'll do it myself. I'll do everything for them. I'll plan and I'll choose and I'll redeem and I'll call and I'll save and I'll preserve. Won't leave anything up to them because if he left anything up to us, he'd mess it up. So God in his wisdom has made things elementary. He's made things simple. So simple that the enlightened philosophers of the day reject the gospel as foolishness because it's just too simple. Pleased God by the foolishness of preaching, the proclamation of his simple message to save them that believe. Does not say that it pleased God to save them that are the smartest. Boy, this one long time simpleton that's glad of that. As a matter of fact, look down at verse 26. Paul says, For you see your calling, brethren. In other words, brothers, look around you. I wonder if any of them were insulted when they read what he says after this. Look around. There's not many wise after the flesh, not many mighty, not many noble or called. But God's chosen the foolish things of the world, that's us, to confound the wise. And God has chosen the weak things of the world to confound the things that are mighty and the base things of the world. And the things which are despised, that's us, hath God chosen. Yea, and things which are not to bring to naught things that are. I love the way Paul writes that there. God chose to make something out of a bunch of nothings so that he could make nothing out of the ones who think they're something. Amen. Verse 29, that no flesh should glory in his presence. Amen. When we're given faith, including on a little piece of the wisdom of God, it's the ones who recognize that we're nothing that can really appreciate it. And Paul says, look around, it's not... It's not the smartest, not the strongest, not the most wealthy, not great nobility. You're the nothings of the world. <coughs> That's who God, his wisdom, is called. When you hear the gospel, when you truly have your heart open to it, it is not the process of grasping the complexity of God. It's the process of being broken by the simplicity and beauty of Jesus Christ. Worldly wisdom cannot appreciate the wisdom of God. The wisdom of God is found in the gospel. It's distributed by Christians who proclaim the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus. And if you are looking for wisdom or for salvation in some other place or in some other way, you're never going to find it. Now, people have looked other places. Verse 22, Paul describes, look, there's Jews who seek a sign, there's Greeks who want wisdom, but we preach Christ crucified. To the Jews, it's a stumbling block. To the Greeks, it's foolishness. But unto them who are called, and incidentally, who are the ones who are called? Both Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power of God, the wisdom of God. Amen. Jews require a sign, Paul said. It's like it was in their nature. It wasn't enough that Jesus stood before them and fulfilled the Old Testament word and brought the simple message of God's news for sinners. They wanted to see magic tricks. They didn't want a Messiah. They wanted a magician. Even when they saw signs, they rejected those signs. I mean, come, think about it. The death of Jesus, the sky went black. The earth shook. Rocks broke into pieces. Graves were opened. Saints rose from the dead, went into the city and talked to folks. And oh, there was a great revival in Jerusalem. No, I don't read that. No. Signs don't bring faith. Yeah. But about six weeks later, some of those same folks who saw the signs heard the simplicity of the gospel as the apostles preached on the day of Pentecost. And they fell to their knees, broken hearted, and said, Brothers, what can we do? Amen. You can stop looking for entertainment and listen to the gospel. Amen. In our text, Paul Amen. also mentions the ineffectiveness of Greek wisdom seekers. You see, they wouldn't look for a sign. They'd, 
then try to rationalize everything they heard. Try to reduce it to its smallest parts. Break it down into little pieces so they can see if they figure out how it works and if it works and if they understand it and whether or not they like it. Folks, you can't do that with God. Colossians 2.28 says, Beware lest any man spoil you through, vain philo through philosophy and vain deceit. Right. Folks, philosophy, worldly wisdom is vain deceit, and it is a pointless lie the vast majority of the time. Understand, the person who's telling you this right now, I consider myself to be a logical person. I always have. But you cannot logic your way to heaven. Philosophy, the wisdom of the world, will take you in so many directions, and in the end, they all might be philosophically satisfying, but none of them are spiritually satisfying. Amen. Because worldly philosophy will rob you of spiritual enlightenment. Amen. Do you understand? That was me. I was the wisdom seeker. And there was a day that this depraved, sinful fool standing before you, a man who had spent much of my life arguing with myself, that you know what, the message of the gospel just doesn't make sense. Why would God send his son to die for me? The death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus for a man who thinks of himself as logical doesn't amount to much as worldly logic does. But then one day, I sat and listened to a man read from these very verses. Verse 18, the preaching of the cross is to them that perish foolishness. And that's me. I realized I'm the one who's perishing. Amen. And that's exactly what I've been thinking about the gospel. But unto, unto us which are saved. Praise God's glory. Unto us that are saved Amen. is the power of God. And the Holy Spirit brought me to life and caused me to understand what a fool I've been. Jesus Christ is the wisdom of God, and it's beyond anything the wisdom of this world can conjure. His wisdom is also beyond the men of this world. There's this one other point that we need to look at, and it comes from the context of the book that Paul's writing. And when I talk about the men of this world and that Jesus' wisdom is beyond the men of this world, you probably instantly think I'm talking about lost, evil men, but I'm not. In the context, Paul is talking about those who we would even consider to be the most godly of men. There were divisions, there were cliques, there were little broken groups in the church at Corinth. Look at verse 11. Paul says, For it's been declared unto me of you, my brethren, by them which are of the house of Chloe, that there are contentions among you. Now I say that every one of you saith, I am of Paul, and I am of Apollos, and I of Cephas, and I of Christ. Now that's not a list of bad guys, is it? Within the church of Corinth, some were proclaiming to be followers of Paul, and others followers of Apollos, and other follower of Pete, followers of Peter. That was Greek tradition. It was to attach yourself with, I mean, you've heard the names Aristotle and Plato and Socrates, and people would say, I'm a follower of Socrates. I'm a follower of Plato. Well, the Corinthians used that and started to apply it to Christianity and say, I'm a follower of Paul. I'm a follower of Apollos. Now understand that that's the context in which Paul presents Jesus Christ as the wisdom of God. He's not talking about those contentions and then going off on a tangent the way we do in our sermons so many times, right? He's talking about that contention, presents Jesus being the wisdom of God and shows how that solves the problems that he, should, he was seeing. We don't have time to deal with all of it, but see how Paul leads up to this point in chapter 3. In chapter 3, verse 11, he says that Jesus... That wisdom of God is the only foundation on which anything can be built by anyone. And then in chapter 3, look at verse 18. Let no man deceive himself. If any man among you seemeth to be wise in this world, let him become a fool that he may be wise. For the wisdom of this world is foolishness with God. For it's written, he taketh the wise in their own craftiness, and again the Lord knoweth the thoughts of the wise, and they are vain. Therefore, let no man glory in men, for all things are yours, whether Paul or Apollos or Cephas 
or the world or life or death or things present or things to come, all are yours. And you are Christ, and Christ is God's. Paul brings these ideas together to remind the Corinthians that the gospel of Jesus Christ, which they follow, the gospel of Jesus Christ is the wisdom of God brought to them. Paul was not the source. Apollos was not the source. Peter was not the source. It was Jesus and him alone. So Paul says, look, you don't follow Paul. You don't follow Peter. You don't follow Apollos. You follow Christ. This applies to us today. Understand, you don't follow Doug. You don't follow Paul. You certainly don't follow Jason. You follow Christ. And understand here, Paul had the opportunity to really lay it on the Corinthians if that's what he wanted to do. He could have said, you know what, I'm the one who came to Corinth. I'm the one who was thrown out of the synagogue. I'm the one who was dragged through the streets of the, to the city elders. Let me tell you who you're going to follow. The church there owes its existence to me. But Paul did not say that. How easily we can deify a pastor. A pastor can get the attitude that we are the source of wisdom for our congregation. All Christians owe our wisdom to one particular man, and that is Jesus Amen. Christ, who is the wisdom of God. Now, so the pastors certainly have a responsibility to lead, but even then, Paul says, you follow me as I follow Christ. In conclusion, I just want you to understand, you don't exist outside of these truths, okay? The very best your own wisdom can offer is absolute foolishness in the eyes of God. It will never, for all of your knowledge, it will not bring you to God, who is the true source of wisdom. Yeah. And if your wisdom can't do it, the only thing that can do it is Jesus Christ. I know that God's Son humiliating himself to become human makes no sense in the world's eyes. I know that his joy in going to the lowest and the poorest and the most pitiful of society is not what worldly wisdom would expect. We understand that the world does not see wisdom and honor in a man who is proclaimed to be a criminal and beaten to the edge of death and stripped of his clothes and nailed to a cross and shed his blood and he did it all for who? The weakest and the lowly and the unwise and the poor and the foolish in the world. The message of the gospel, about the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus, we understand it is not an enlightened viewpoint from the world's perspective. And you might think, you know, I can't believe that. People will think I'm soft-minded. They'll think I'm weak. They'll call me a fool. You know what? You're absolutely right. That's exactly what they'll do. But look back at our text at verse 25 for a moment. The foolishness of God is wiser than men. And the weakness of God is stronger than men. What you consider wise in this world is foolishness to God. And what the world considers as foolishness, it's Christ who is the wisdom of God. You struggled with that for a while. I struggled with it. If your experience is anything like mine, you'll find out that as you struggle with it, it'll bully you. It'll get a hold of you and knock you down and make you say uncle and then pick you up and make you carry its book bags. I mean, just to say, you're not going to win. Because Jesus Christ is the power of God and the wisdom of God. Beyond all the power of this world, beyond all the wisdom of this world, and certainly beyond all the men. They just can't compete with him. They'll stumble over him. They'll think him to be foolish, but he's going to make them look foolish, as foolish as he did Sennacherib, because he's going to be victorious over them and victorious over you because he is Jesus Christ, the wisdom of God. Amen. 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 Amen.